Hello, everyone, and welcome to block party number 47. We're fast approaching the one year mark on block parties. Um, and uh, we're excited to be kicking off Food Healers, which has become our anchor both morning and evening program, 7 to 9 a.m. and 7 to 9 p.m. every Friday. We take on food and we've got a what we've got wonderful leadership here in the room and Dr. Silas Rao I am so proud to have you here and that you're really leading the charge you're the one who came up with the concept of food healers and uh, it's been quite a ride um, love to hear from you love to hear from everyone so I'm going to pass the talking feather and looking forward to exciting conversation thank you Jamin yeah, so my update for today is that uh, the food shipment did not happen to the Navajo Nation because they said they have plenty of food for this week. So we're going to have to call back next week. The temple is ready to cook. And I think uh, we have a situation where I think lots of places of worship would be happy to cook, you know, especially those who have kitchens available to them. So it's a matter of connecting that with healthy food. And they're willing to cook universal meals. So they, they looked through all the recipes from the PCRM website and they said, yeah, we'd be happy to cook this. So uh, we do have this. So there is someone ready to supply healthy food and <laughs> we need to get people to eat that, <laughs> to, to get healthy. Meanwhile, I think, um, so also the, uh, I was contacted by Umano. So I had a meeting with Umano uh, which is an organization out of Los Angeles, and they want to help us with the, with the Vegan World 2026, making Vegan World 2026 happen. And so they're going to be participating in the um, convergence at the end of the month. And um, they want to see what are all, what are all the projects we are working on, what we want to, what do we want support on, and then see how they can support us. So it's a, uh, it's a really good organization, it looks like, you know, and uh, so we'll see where that goes. T t tell us more about them. Where, 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 where do you say they're located and what's, what's kind of the gist? So Umanu is an, um, is, a, is an organization that has been doing a lot of work in Pakistan. Um, actually, I think there's a separate organization that's been doing a lot of work in Pakistan, but this is the same gentleman who funded that organization. So that organization has done, uh, I think they're schooling, they've schooled over a million kids in Pakistan. So, um, and so now Umano, so he became vegan two, a uh, year and a half ago, two years ago. So now he's trying to promote veganism. So that's uh, Umano. And um, so they have, funded a few projects and they're looking for more good projects to fund. And where are they based? He's, uh, he's out of Los Angeles. Um, the founder is out of Los Angeles, but I think they have people all over the world. I mean, I saw, I saw people there who work for Umano, who are from Toronto, who are from, uh, you know, Africa, everywhere. So it's an interesting uh -huh. organization. And um, so if, I mean, one of the things we could, we are going to propose to them, I'm thinking of proposing to them is, is this vegan community, right? So Sacred Lifeline Project, something like a Sacred Life, but making it uh, something that grows over time and has a, um, has an entrance exam for people to get in. Right? So you get certified as a vitally engaged guardian of animal and nature, vegan. <laughs> and then you're allowed to go in. <laughs> so we need to make it aspirational that people want to go to that place. Oh my God, I know how awesome that is because there is no garbage truck there in that community. <laughs> Everything is, is you know, I mean, it's sustainable, right? So we need to create an example of a sustainable community in which, um, in which we are not producing waste and the waste is going back into nature. And um, 
but people are leading good lives, right? So happy, healthy lives. And making sure that, uh, and they're measuring their ecological footprint and making sure that if everyone lives like them, the planet will, you know, we'll only need uh, half the planet or less. So the other half can be given back to wildlife. So all these things have to be put in place, you know, the engineering of it has to be done. And so that's what I'm going to propose to them. If you want to do a larger um, project that you want to fund. And Silas, let me ask you just very, very frankly, like what do you mm -hmm. feel about this idea of getting a Tesla food truck and doing parts of Los Angeles and really making it a story, right? Right, right. Where, I mean, mm -hmm. see, I think that uh, who, who is going to do the cooking there? So I'm thinking that if you have an, a community in which there is a, there is a, uh, there's two preparation factory built in, right? And it's all using solar energy, right? I mean, I'm thinking in the future, that's what it will be, right? And then from there, you can take a Tesla truck to the larger community and feed. So that could be the service that this community does. I see that as the futuristic thing that we can do, so we can showcase, that would make people say, damn it, I wanna be there. I don't wanna be here at all, okay? I wanna be there. Because that's, I think we need to create that kind of momentum for the vegan movement. Okay, that will make the vegan movement just explode. Uh, right now, you know, if we just sit here and say, uh, go ahead, Ray. I was just thinking about uh, different, who might be a good ally for this kind of a project in LA. And uh, Pastor Rick Warren is a, tr a, you know, a mega church who do the Daniel plan where they, they eat a vegan diet, they encourage their congregation to eat a vegan diet. And they are in um, Lake Forest, California, which is just outside of LA. Hmm. Yeah, if you could contact him and say, you know, uh, could you do something like this where you have, uh, they create, you know, and they cook stew and take it out to the community and give it away and have it funded by his, his congregation. That's the kind of thing that we need to be doing for food healers, right? But, but that's, see that's within this, with the current civilization that is all messed up anyway. So I'm thinking about, with Umana, I'm thinking about uh, asking them to do something like this, you know, funding a, an, an, a way of living that you can show is basically sustainable, okay? So, so that you create a momentum towards everyone wanting to live like that. Because we are all living in houses built of wood. I mean, the hell, you know, <laughs> it's going to burn if, if there's a fire here. <laughs> That's stupid. Why do you keep building out of wood? <laughs> so everything that we do, I mean, we, and we've got all this, you know, I mean, uh, the, the walls are covered with toxins. <laughs> And we are bringing in plastic stuff full of toxins in here. So we shouldn't, I mean, so that's not an example of uh, sustainable living for sure, right? If we are living in the current system. So you really need to create an example that people can say, you know, I mean, the others are trying to do that. They are, there are all kinds of eco villages around, right? But the eco villages are, they, uh, they're not vegan or they don't say they're vegan. They're trying to raise all these animals in there. So fundamentally, when we don't start with a vegan foundation, we are lying to ourselves. So as an engineer, I, I just, you know, I just rebel against that. <laughs> you can't build on a foundation of lies and expect it to work. So yeah, we'll see how it goes. Maybe, you know, when, when you have a setback like this, like what happened with me yesterday, I, I just assume that this is not the way, that there is something else that I need to be looking at. But it is all, you know, I mean, but at the same time, you see, I got connected with Umano. <laughs> I had no idea <laughs> that was going to happen. 
uh, so uh, I think Zara, Zara from Umano came to one of our movement Mondays, uh, like a couple of weeks ago. And then, and then she said, hey, I want you to meet my boss. And I said, sure, I'd love to meet your boss. And, and then um, she just set it up. She asked what day would be good for you. And I, so we just set it up for this Wednesday. And I spoke to the guy and, you know, and we hit it off. He's, he's Muslim from Pakistan and I'm a Hindu from India and we're hitting it off. And I said, hey, this, maybe this is it. <laughs> and I mentioned, mentioned my meeting to uh, Carl LeBlanc, who's an Englishman from the UK. <laughs> and he said, I want to write a proposal for him. I said, okay, go for it. <laughs> so that's how it's working out, right? What's Carl? Carl's a uh, uh, marketing manager. Um, yeah, Carl is the one who did our website, right? So Carl did, I mean, he's really good at uh, branding things and, you know, making things look good. And so, um, so Carl said, yeah, you know, I mean, because UK is going through some really bad economic times, you know, and they are, uh, um, the COVID is COVID is rampant there, and they've been locked down, and they did the Brexit, which pulled their economy down by another ten percent. <laughs> it's stupid. <laughs> They're all waiting in the on the border to Europe. <laughs> they can't send their stuff over. Uh, it, it's a mess, right? So they're all saying, "The hell with this. We need to start over." And. Uh, well, speaking of starting over, isn't that a kind of starting over? Um, because as a diabolical vegan, I'm thinking of how much damage this is doing to their dairy industry. Mm -hmm. And some industries, you know, may be set to fail on their own. And something like Brexit comes along and helps, helps move that along. And uh, we're all about these changing from systems of normalized violence to nonviolence. And how do the how do you make that transition? And this has really got to be our school. We've got to study these these uh, systems as they fail. So that's of particular interest when there's a kind of an accelerated program right. in the UK. So what does an industry failing look like? Because we we've seen shifts from industries, like we've seen the uh, heart and buggy industry pretty much be replaced by automobiles, but uh, we see we're probably closer akin to uh, smoking the tobacco industry, which, you know, it's, <laughs> it never dies. It's always tries to find a, a way to survive. And it's usually through trade and export. We can't uh, right. addict American children anymore. So let's go to Asia and uh, right. they have no rules there. So we'll be able to hook whoever we want. So trade usually is this backup plan to maintain any industry. And uh, I keep saying that we could probably turn the entire United States, all of North America, vegan, and we'll still have exactly the same animal agriculture system exporting everything somewhere else. <laughs> Look at China and go, wow, there's like uh, several times our population. We could keep feeding them forever. So it's kind of a, a global solution we need to come up with where um, hopefully we can learn from China and China can lead the way in, in eating less meat rather than being that market. You know, and of course, China, just like everywhere else, has those two bases. There's the people, there's the governments and, and uh, the profiteers. That's three. <laughs> but uh, it, it really has to be a global thing. And the more I analyze the FAO, they, mm -hmm. they're not taking that notion of how do we discourage this appetite for meat? They're saying, how do we meet the demands? Because you know, money is to be made, and you can't deny people money, right? If that's just beyond the pale. <laughs> How do we get? It's it's kind of like the the uh, USDA all over. We need to promote uh, jobs, but at the, the same time, uh, tell people what's bad for you and what's uh, what you should be consuming instead. Yeah. You know, I mean, I. Uh the good thing about doing a course or teaching a course is that you're forced to think about things one more time, right? And <laughs> do over and listen to others, you know, in the, in the class and so on. So 
Um, so I was able to take the, you know, the seven core shifts and the four, so the, so the four things that I had on top, I made them the cultural shifts. And then the bottom one would be the civilizational shifts. And it turned out that the cultural shifts are really about changing the story, stories of violence to stories of non-violence. Non, non and then the games from cooperative, I mean, competitive games to cooperative games, from finite games to infinite games, right? And then changing the rituals. So rituals of a predator species, because that's what we do. You know, our festivals are all about celebrating the fact that we are predators. So we killed, we killed the turkey. We killed this, we killed that, and we ate it. And, oh, we milked this cow. And so therefore we have now, you know, milk sweets. So if you look at all of our uh, rituals, they're all about us being a predator species. So you need to now turn that into a rituals of a caretaker species, right? So different rituals. And then the finally, the, the fourth transformation I said was for um, habits. Habits of a homo sapiens sapiens are habits of a self-important species that's going around stomping on insects, you know, <laughs> putting, I mean, killing them when they come inside a home and that sort of stuff to the habits of a, of homo ahimsa, of a non-violent um, species, right? caretaker. So when you look at that, you realize that we're talking about a model that's the exact opposite of what we are doing today. And you don't go from where you are to the exact opposite by tweaking one at a time. It's really, you know, you really have to build another one. So it's becoming increasingly clear to me that the Sacred Lifeline project, you know, was necessary, is necessary, but it, it has to be a Sacred Lifeline throughout the whole world. It cannot be just somewhere in Costa Rica. <laughs> it has to be, there are, have to be, you know, you have to sort of build with a larger um, design in mind, like perhaps what, uh, Jim Hicks talks about, you know, like, like a Gratola or the Great Big Northern, you know, one of those corridors of civilization, human civilization, the rest being given away, given back to nature, right? So then we have to say, okay, this is part of this Gratola, Sacred Lifeline Project, and we're just putting one, few of them here and here, and then we are going to connect them, and then we're going to grow them. So and then we have people funneling into them, right? So you have to have a mechanism for people funneling into them where people go through a new academy. So a climate healers academy or something like that where they learn what to do. So that's, so that's what I'm going to be proposing during the convergence that we do. And um, that's the vision I'm gonna propose and say, this is what I, I think we are going, going to go. And these are the seven strategic actions. It's the same seven strategic actions that we had last time. And this is the progress we have made so far on these actions. So that's what I'm going to be talking about uh, during the opening plenary. That uh, the migratory corridor idea would be large enough to the extent that you have to involve the government and have some sort of a rewilding program, right? So, I mean, it's not a, a strictly people run by that scale. I'm not, you were kind of describing it all. I don't know if there's a chronology. <laughs> Right. Makes sense I mean, culmination. Uh, you know, I mean, this is just the culmination of all the uh, moon podcasts that I've done with so many people. And you know, I'm just absorbing information from lots of people and trying to put it together. That's what systems engineers do anyway. And I'm, so I'm saying, you know, uh, what is coming to me is that we, we can start with smaller maybe 100 acres, 200 acres, something like that, build a community. And with the idea that there's gonna be another 100 acres somewhere else that's gonna be bought and built on. And, and so that we're gonna create these, you know, little, little pockets, and then we're going to connect them up. Well, what about big pockets? If there's a, a crisis in the farming industry and we're trying to transition people to future-proofed future uh, means of uh, production, hmm. what about, uh, getting farmers involved and subsidizing this crop called trees. Right. They either get into forest farming where right. you farm specifically to try to um, create fauna that is permaculture and, and is um, capturing carbon, but also 
rewilding, which is a lot more intensive and requires a lot more connected land. So it's a little bit more tricky to, to get the farmers involved in that because they have to be neighbors. Um, yeah, the rewilding has to happen in the north-south corridors, right? So, yeah. so the idea That's behind... Connected to, from what I've heard. Yeah, the idea that Jim, Jim Hicks is talking about is that, you know, uh, people who live in a east-west corridor, because we tend to have uh, the same requirements in terms of our body heat, you know, <laughs> whereas, whereas animals, you know, they need to migrate as things change because they, uh, they don't have climate control around them. And, uh, you know, so we pick a east-west corridor that is ideal for us. And then we have to make sure that when, uh, when it crosses this north-south corridor, we put it on stills or something so that we don't bother them. <laughs> and we cross over them as opposed to building in the middle of them right, and cutting them off. This so is all looking at the half E.O. Wilson's half earth solution, which uh, involves giving half the, the world back to the animals. Eventually, you, there's a bunch of projects, like you mentioned, the North, Northwest, the Great Northern. Great Big Northern, yeah. Great Big Northern, which, um, which where was that connecting? Well, he was thinking of somewhere from Washington to New York, Washington State to New York, so Seattle to New York type of thing. Seattle to New York. So there's yeah. another one that, that runs from California to uh, Florida. Well, initially it was California Atlanta, to, no, Atlanta to Florida. Georgia. Yeah. Atlanta to... Called it Gratola in the beginning, which was uh, uh, from Atlanta to LA. And it's only like two miles wide? Uh, no, it was that, uh, that one was 10 miles wide. He was talking about 10 miles wide. So basically, you know, we, the bicycle, you should be able to get to the nearest station to do your, uh, get on a train to go anywhere you want to go. Assuming you really want to go lots of places. <laughs> These are all topics that we were talking about in the uh, um, study group with the Vegan World 2026. Go ahead, Kate. Nature stewardship. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, Ray. Well, I, ju I just had a few thoughts as you were speaking. You, uh, your expression is so, both of you, Ray and Silas, you just say things in such a clear manner. I can't express it any better. Um, and, and you know, what Ray says about studying systems as they fail, isn't that our greatest teacher right now? But as you were speaking about the trees, you know, I got to thinking about the 8 billion trees movement and Claire Du Bois and Julie just interviewed Claire two days ago, you know, uh, 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 she's a powerful voice. They, she's got that, uh, what, what's it called? What's her organization called? Women for Trees, Trees or, oh, I can't even think of it right now. She's an Australian woman, Claire Du Bois, and I can't think of her organization right now. But I'm just, I, I guess I'm mentioning these goofy tidbits because I know the engineer puts these things together in ways that, you know, I don't really understand. And the other thing that I flashed on was uh, 10,000 Turtles to Tucum Carry. It was a book written by, I took care of an old boy at the VA, you know, and he just loved me and got, got Garrett, Garrett, Garrett. I can't remember his first name right now. It's been a long time. Anyway, in the 1930s, he worked for the Railway Express and it was just the infancy of the rail system at all. And there is so much insight in this book. And when you reflect back that that's less than a hundred years, Mm -hmm. Clink Garrett, Clink Garrett was his name, the old mm -hmm. boy. He was 90 some when I finally met him and uh, 10,000 Turtles to Tucum Carry just really made you, uh, 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 it was all about, you know, how do we get things there? And now we know how to get things there and the packaging waste that goes along with it is just I mean, you know, choke us. It's choking us, obviously. And anyway, those right. are just some thoughts that were running through my head. 
and loving you all. <laughs> Thank you, Kate. Yeah, um, it's a foundational shift, right? So basically, the two foundational axioms in the current civilization that we need to shift, which is going to be the topic of my next class anyway, Kate. So you're going to get a preview of it here. <laughs> and so the two foundational things that are changing is, one, animals on the earth were put here for humans to exploit. That's not true. Okay, so that's not true. In fact, we are here to serve them, not the other way around. They're not here to serve us. We are here to serve them. And uh, the second foundational shift that needs to happen is we, we, we need to get our happiness from outside, from eating, you know, rich foods and, you know, and going places and seeing things. And that's what, that's where we get our happiness from. That's the foundation of the current system. Without which the consumer society just disappears, right? No one will buy anything because, <laughs> because they realize the happiness is not out there. It's in, in within you. And so that's the second shift that needs to happen. And this is why I say there has to be some kind of a graduation from an academy before people join this new community. And that graduation would be, you know, teaching these two fundamental things, right? And then figuring out how to, how to live in harmony with nature, right? How to be, how to contribute. What is your gift that you're going to contribute? When you go join the community. Um, it's, I mean, eventually everyone will be there, but you know, everyone, so meaning this academy has to be completely online. So anyone can take it, <laughs> anyone can come and graduate and then they can apply, right? Then we go through some kind of selection process depending on how many uh, slots are open in the community. And then people keep donating to this thing to build more communities, you know, because, hey, we like, we want to be there. Go ahead, Jamin. Yeah, I, I really love the idea of an online academy. I want to welcome uh, Alan, who's uh, dialing in from Scotland. Great to see you, Alan. Feel free to say hello. We are recording, and uh, we can pause any time. Just do this or ask for pause. Um, and in terms of the online academy, um, mm. you know, I, I really like that idea. And um, we've been working on a, a, a concept that we've been talking about the last week very intensively, which is culminating in the idea of an intentional city. See, a lot of what we're talking about are, it could be put in the framework of an intentional community. Well, Ananda, uh, who will be joining us at 10 a.m. this morning, if not earlier, Pacific time in a couple hours, um, she was born in an intentional community and has lived for like over half a century cumulatively total in different intentional communities. So she gave us a presentation last week that just blew our minds about all of her different learnings from intentional communities. Well, one thing led to another and we are now in the process of forming an intentional city, but in the clouds, that's ICIC, intentional city in the clouds. Because if you think about it, see, we're, we're here to re-architect and rebuild a new world, right? Mm -hmm. And when you, set about architecting anything what you don't do is just go to a construction site and then with picks and shovels start digging and laying bricks and concrete and then kind of figuring out as you go along no 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 the architecting of the thing is done in an architecture firm well we have the massive task of re-architecting and rebuilding a new world right along the lines of everything that we've been talking about right and we're kind of here on the ground with picks and shovels. And then all of a sudden the steamroller comes along with a different idea and, and runs us over. And um, so what if we created, what if we first architected the architecture firm, but in a safe place in the clouds, very similar to what you're talking about with your, with your academy, uh, Silas, um, but actually have a whole city with universities and academies and all kinds of different infrastructure that's a safe place removed from all the chaos and dust and jackhammers and noise and fighting and, and this and that. I mean, the current system is so broken. 
And Ananda also makes a really good point that humanity has never figured out how to unify across tribes, across peoples, across nations, you know, really, truly unify. You know, there have been some notable counterexamples to that thesis, notably World War II, when a bunch of nations got together and said, hey, stop. But it was really to, to stop an enemy tribe that had gone way out of its bounds. And so uh, the, the challenge remains, how do we, how do we unify? Silas, looks like you've got an idea. Yeah, no, I was, I mean, I, I agree. No, I mean, I, I was going to say that um, as, an, uh, as someone who has run engineering teams that worked on a focused project, uh, I have seen humans unify for a common purpose and get things done, right? And do it successfully too. There are two foundations to that. One, everyone has to be working for the same purpose and they have to be open and honest with each other. Otherwise, the project doesn't work. If you're competing with each other and you're saying, I'm going to keep a secret from the other guy and all that, <laughs> the project does not work, Okay, period. So it has to be a cooperative, consensual, and open society for the project to work. And it has to be based on the truth. So when you make a mistake, you have to be open to admit it and then you know fix it and move on. Right? Because we all make mistakes. We are all imperfect beings, but we are putting something together which is better than us. Right? And that's what engineering projects are. So I'm saying that we have done this. You know, we have done big, big engineering projects also. And we know how to do it. And we know it, is, it has to be based on the truth. It has to be based on openness and, and, and integrity. Okay? Uh, our civilization, unfortunately, is based on lying to us, right? There are lots of lies. Tell people, hey, you are, uh, we give you independence, but we colonize you through, your <laughs> through the currency system, right? <laughs> Stuff like this. I mean, we give you freedom from slavery. You're no longer slaves, but then we're going to throw you in jail and make you work. You know, uh, these are all, we say something and do the opposite, which is contrary to engineering, right? Engineering does not work that way. You'll never get anything done that way that works. So we know that, right? I mean, we're actually talking on something that was designed with that principle. Go ahead, Ray. Oh, Kelly. Actually, what I just wanted to say, you might be interested in connecting with uh, Plantipa. Um, they've got a, a group that's uh, for intentional communities. And uh, it's interesting because I, I really don't think they've thought of the idea of a, of a cloud intentional community. So, uh, and they have a um, discord group uh, that may, you know, just if, you know, if you're just focused on intentional communities, um, you know, to throw that idea out at them because right now they're just absorbing anything and everything as they sort of brainstorm, right? So, uh, I don't know if you know the Plantica or yeah, yeah, I yeah. interviewed them yeah. a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So um, that that uh, Discord group is very active in in, uh, in the discussion about it. So uh, they would probably love to hear from your your contact, Jamin, and also proposing the idea of of, of a cloud or um, intentional community, even if it being beginning as they kind of think about a physical intentional community. Yeah, uh, in fact, they're they are going to be presenting during our conversions, Mantica. And uh, so I connected them with uh, Jim Hicks, who's, so I said, Plantica seems to be like the entrance exam, right? To Jim Hicks's. <laughs> so it's like, yeah, the vegans coming together and saying, yeah, we know how to live like this now. So let's figure out, okay, that's what we need to do over there. So then it's, everything has to be open source. We have to tell them, look, uh, what you're doing, you know, here's a better way to do it. And what they're doing also should be open source. So it's really a um, mechanism by which we are improving ourselves as we go along. I found another international community in Belize. By chance last night, I was actually i was looking at someone who was like um anti-maskers and i was like i'm getting rid of them all on my 
this web page and I was kind of stumbling and going, who's liking all these like, you know, propaganda, QAnon conspiracies. And I found this woman who liked these posts. I'm like, oh, that's too bad. She was QAnon. She was living in an intentional community in Belize. So I was like, oh, that's, that's kind of cool. It's too bad that she has these things, but, but I, I'd never heard it. Um, but it, it seemed to be well situated. So you might want to look into what they're doing and how they're being successful. Yeah, the polarization that has happened in the U.S. now, you know, I mean, one side thinks that the other side is crazy, but both sides are like that. <laughs> they think that these guys are crazy. <laughs> so it's really polarized, right? So how do you unite this? Yeah. You can't, I mean, with, unless you have a different model. Right? Yeah. We have to do a different model to get, get people to say, yeah, we can just forget this and we'll go over there, right? Basically, we become a veganaut to join this. You have to become a veganaut. <laughs> yeah because i was thinking about that I'm like oh this is great i totally want to be part of an intentional community but if that's kind of people that live there or like conspiracy theorists i don't know if i get along with them well, you, said the way <laughs> you know so like but then how do you have that respect like we're not you know because i know a lot of the people i know when we first discussed with Atlantica, it was like kind of having this you know how do you decide who lives there and and you know it comes down to personality and, and like you don't have to completely be on the same board with someone in every single point of view but being respectful right and but you know also knowing your own personal thresholds of what you can tolerate right yeah like yeah. In, in their last meeting about contentious community and, and they were talking about ones that failed and they quite often fail because of personality conflicts as, as, yeah. as happens with humans but but I pointed out that uh, when you were talking about the Sacred Lifeline project, that's about doing something and sharing it with the world. Whereas a lot of people that want to do this want to escape from the world, so that's like a huge opposite uh, pressure. So you really have to be on upfront and on board with with uh, a very like minded community, not just want to get away from it all and try something different. You have to really have uh, a, a very similar value set. So you're your idea of having a uh, a quiz, <laughs> a, a graduated process to to gain access to this community makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I, uh, Climate Healers Academy is already up and running. Uh, you can take a look at it, I and mean, it's so it's right now just points back to Climate Healers, but it's that's where the course material that I am creating will be put, and it will become like an online course that people can take. Uh, you know, essentially saying this is how an engineer would look at it, okay? And among all the professions that we have created on this planet, right, in the civilization, uh, it turns out that engineers are the ones who were created for building things that actually work, right? <laughs> so which means you have to get grounded in the truth. <laughs> we have to be, we are trained to fig figure out the bullshit in science and throw it away. Yeah, that's my job. That's why I'm able to look at the IPCC's work and say, that is bullshit. <laughs> that part is bullshit. This part I'll take because this is data. <laughs> Maybe the data, is, if the data is too much bullshit, then you know, it's really hard for us to do anything with it. But <laughs> I assume that that data is correct, but this clearly is bullshit. I can prove it to you. We should work with a, a vegan MP in, in Canada, in Nathaniel Erskine Smith. And he's, he helped me, he uh, presented my petition to uh, Canadian Parliament to have uh, food choices added to the top 10 things that you could do for uh, climate change, which obviously wasn't on the uh, Canadian website, which they, Environment Canada solved by removing the page you know, there's nothing you can do <laughs> except for count on the government. So one of the outcomes of this, this, uh, I mean, they, it was presented to Parliament and they, they gave me a response, which was just such a kick the can down the road response. Uh, it makes me feel like there's nothing that the government can do until society changes. 
they look at that uh, like if you call them vegan solutions obviously there's there's a built-in bias to uh, calling it that that uh, I mean I happen to know that there's an opposite bias called meat consumption and it's uh, plugs up the ears a lot more than the vegan bias does but what do we expect of the government what like if we are building a grassroots movement is there any role that the government can can play until we build a society that will make that government say yes and it's tell the truth it's basically just plain out tell the truth so that was an example of trying to get them to tell one truth and they ran it by the agribusiness department they said no way just just kill the the website i'm sure that's what happened right so just get them to tell the truth and 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 really it's funny because a lot of people will say well we'll never have a vegan world okay so tell everybody that we need a vegan world and let's see if we can get one if we don't then we don't no we can't tell them that <laughs> can't you tell them that if you if you're 100 percent convinced that we're not going to have a vegan world why not tell them that why is it a secret why do you have to keep it buried why do you have to oppose it at every turn because they're afraid it'll happen right <laughs> that's the opposite of not believing it. it's it's fearing that it will and it will uh create uh, things into motion that, that they won't be able to control economically. That's their only concern. This is, a, this is a monster that you let the vegan monster out and all of a sudden you don't have control over, over the flow of the economy, which is what they're elected to do, ostensibly. Go ahead, Alan. Um, Scottish government um, is very, very keen on all things eco-friendly. And I discussed all these ideas you're talking about from another group that I was in. And I was in a, a government office and they said, you should write out a business proposal. We would give you the money to do it. The Scottish government loves these ideas. Okay. The next climate change meeting is in Glasgow. So I'm going to get Carl to write it up for the Scottish government then. <laughs> Yay. Go we ahead, have Jamie. Muir and Clan Kerr here, so we'll, we'll try to get the uh, Scottish Canadians <laughs> going. Go ahead, Jamin. Thank you, thank you. A uh, really great conversation. Um, Ray, to your earlier points, um, another uh, about the truth and whatnot. Um, another great Canadian, John Ralston Saul, wrote a book called Voltaire's Bastards, and it's all about using reason as a tool using truth as a tool, using lies as a tool. And of course they studied the American government and the use of lies, et cetera. But we are a tool using species. And so the first thing is the objective. It's not so much the truth as an objective. There's an objective and then, well, gee, what's the best way to achieve that objective? Truth, okay, uh, lies, uh, even better. You know, <laughs> uh, so we, <laughs> really we, we, have to, we have to be cognizant of this and um, but the, the, and this gets me to the point I want to make about intentional communities is that we've got all these different communities that are that are coming together with, you know, here, you know, we're an intersection of communities, right? We've got, you know, the conversation and the press conference that are not intersecting with climate healers, intersecting with food healers. And um, but the reality is we've we've got slightly different agendas, let's say, right? Um, where we intersect is a plant-based diet, feeding everyone, et cetera. Um, but we all have kind of different ideas as to how we want to get there. And so I think what, what one thing that's, that's really important is that we acknowledge that these different communities are different. These different intentional communities are different. And the part of the big inspiration around an intentional city is that we create a safe space for all these different intentional communities to coexist and collaborate and converse. And ultimately we need to work towards some form of consensus where we say, okay, we don't necessarily agree on everything, but we definitely agree on the big picture and you know, how, can, how can we work together? So um, I really think that's crucial is that we acknowledge our differences and and yet the commonality is of 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 99 of change makers and all of us 
is we want a world that works, that's nonviolent, that's peaceful, that respects and heals nature and all these things. Now, how do we get there? Well, that's where we need to come together and talk about it, do exactly what we're doing right here, right? Um, and, you know, I hear what you're saying, Silas, about, hey, well, you know, we need to form this community that really gets it right holistically and all that. And, and, I, and I have a lot of respect for that perspective. My perspective as regards food healers is, comes from a whole different angle that says, look, let's get the food part right. Let's go to Los Angeles where they're leaving, living totally unsustainable lifestyles in a totally unsustainable watershed, et cetera, et cetera. And let's get the food part right. And to Ray's earlier point, I want to wait till I get Ray's here and Kelly's. Um, and Ray, I also really agree with what you said about exporting, right? What is the number one place for exporting culture around the world? Los Angeles, right? So anyway, I want to take the approach where we do the food healers thing in LA, just Toronto. as a pure place. Toronto, fine, but one city, let's take one city, or maybe it's a tale of two cultural city. And I was like, I mean, we just brag about it all the time and I have no idea if it's true or not. I would think that like London might be more multicultural, but. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no. We, 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 the truth is we've got a, a number of very multicultural cities um, to take your pick. But rather than try to, you know, argue this point, um, you know, how should we start an intentional community or just doing food healers in one city? Um, my, my larger point is let's co-create an intentional city in the clouds, you know, this kind of virtual architectural firm for re-architecting life on Earth. And let's have the conversations there in a safe space where different communities can retain their identity. Okay, fine. I'm a community that's focused on this. Fine. Great. We're focused on this. And um, I was having this conversation yesterday um, with, with Dana Tomasino, and I was telling her about the concept of ICIC. And I said, you know, it should be all of the, uh, we should, the, the fundamental is it's about saving, healing, and transforming life on earth. And she said, well, wait a second, not all of us are agreeing with this model of saving, right? Yes, we're all, you know, so it's like, what, what would the foundation of an intentional city be that could include, that's broad enough and inclusive enough, and yet has the right stuff, the right kind of foundation? Anyway, I just want to put these thoughts on the table. Mm -hmm. See, James Lovelock made it very, very simple. So, I mean, he said something very simple. He said, if as a result of the human presence, the earth improves, we will thrive. If as a result of human presence, the earth deteriorates, we are going extinct. Okay, so very simple. <laughs> and so the question, so that's a common project now, right? How do we make the earth improve as a result of human presence? That's a common project. And I've never implemented a common project in which people are fighting with each other and figuring out you know, who's better than who. So this entire model of competition has got to go so right away. You know, I said, okay, I've never built a project that works like that, okay, that works. I've had projects that failed. And I said, you know, bastards, next time, I don't wanna hear this. <laughs> From a systems perspective, I don't wanna hear it. You, if you know something, tell them. Okay, if you know something that can be done better, tell him uh, you know, or tell her so that we can all work together to create something that's better, right? <clears throat> so, so it has to be an op open source, cooperative. So exactly the opposite of what we are doing today, right? Everything has to be the opposite of what we are doing today. How do we create something that's the opposite of what we are doing today by tweaking what we are doing today? No, you can't do it. So I love the idea of an intentional community in the clouds, okay? But that intentional community has to get translated to things on the ground that connect, okay? That connect. So the intentional community has to have examples that are put down once in a while, right? Put down once in a while. And then we connect and say, yeah, I think what we were talking about does actually implement work right in practice. So when what we say and what we do are not in alignment, that there is something wrong in, in our assumptions. 
So we have to figure out what is the what is the axiom that's wrong, right? So this is what Richard Feynman pointed out when this space shuttle Challenger blew up. He said, you know, <laughs> somebody missed out on some fundamental facts. Because marketing, they were marketing instead of looking at listening to the engineer who was screaming saying, hey, it won't work if you do this. That resonated funny with my next talking point because you're talking about this open source and, and uh, this idea of owning ideas has been a, a, um, just a huge problem and, and such a core part of capitalism itself. I was going to say something about Yuval Noah Harari, and every time I mention him, there's somebody who goes, "Well, you know, he's just derivative ideas from from uh, Jared Diamond and, and list all these other people. There are no original ideas. You're you're always building on the backs of somebody else." Exactly. But the thing that he was that popped in my mind was he talks about how we're essentially with with building intentional communities, going back to those tribal days. Find your tribe. Everybody is. And, you, and in a tribe, you have to have trust. So trust is the is the currency of uh, of a tribe, and anybody outside of the tribe has the potential of being the other, you know, the opposing tribe that that uh, that you were against. So who who are tribes that you can trade with, and you have a network of 150 people that you can get to know really well, and beyond that, you need some other sort of structure in order to expand the tribe. So if we need a global community, we need some sort of way of creating individual tribes that are all connected, yet don't create that, that automatic, it's always based on fear, this fear that that other tribe is going to get you. So there's, like right. Bob talks about the Leviathan and everybody right. degenerates into a state of fear where they have to attack somebody for fear that they will be attacked at some point right. in the future. So uh, I think resilience in communities, and I think that there's when you talk about environmentalism, you find a lot more rational people at the local level. And at the national level, it's all competitive. It's our country has to defend against that country. Exactly. So they have to be able to support all these different uh, and differently minded communities and make them successful. Not make them the same, not give them all rules that are exactly identical, but make them successful in their help them out wherever they can and we have more laws at the local level and uh, Jeremy Lane talked about the uh, the idea that all of our borders are, are political and arbitrary and, and completely ignore the national con the natural contours so right. California could be five different states with particular interests whether you live in the desert or the mountains or the or the fertile valley or the ocean and um, we were just talking about earlier that like we have more in common in toronto with detroit than we do with vancouver <laughs> right. because we're great lakes country with cities exactly vancouver's a, a like a, on a, in the ocean on the west coast so if you build communities based on who you are and, and where you are and you thrive the trick is how do you do that without becoming this granular um, tribe that fights against other tribes? That's so it's, it's all that's about you know yeah. getting rid of these violent systems. And if you don't have the violent systems, you don't have this otherism problem to a degree. It'll right. always be there, but it, it's always easier to be control something when you're aware of it rather than when you just operate on gut instinct and. Well, See, the whole discussion started with my um, my WhatsApp group, and uh, they were they were sort of uh, going ecstatic about India's win over Australia, you know, in cricket. <laughs> India won <laughs> the series two one or something like that, and it was the most spectacular win ever. I mean, uh, what did they think they said you know, unbelievable victory for, win for India. And I said, that's also the most unbelievable loss for Australia, okay? I mean, it's just a matter of luck. I mean, this one guy, he should have been out at, if, if the umpire had said he was out when he was two, he would have been out. But the umpire said he was not out. And then they did a review and they said, well, it's umpire's decision, right? So 
that guy actually played for the next five hours and wore the bowlers out. <laughs> and, and so then someone else came and banged the heck out of them and scored all the runs, right? So anyway, it's, it's just a tiny little thing that made one team win over the other. I said, as long as we play competitive games like this, right? It's always going to be one over the other. It's always going to be a proxy for war. So we need to figure out how to turn that into a cooperative game, an infinite game. So we should not be playing, we should not be normalizing competitive finite games. We should be normalizing cooperative infinite games. This is a lesson I learned from Kimaya. Kimaya hates these competitive games. She just, she just changes the rules and says, okay, we're going to do it this way now. And yeah, you know, there was this board that board game that she got, which had like these two pegs that went from one through ten, and and each person rolls the dice and figures out, you know, I can go from one to two if I roll a two, or if the, uh, you know, if I roll two numbers, so the sub the subtract the two is two, you know, so you can do some math, right? Based on that, you can roll go from one to two to three, etc. And the object of the game is to figure out who gets there first, who's the winner, right? She said, no, I don't like that. So she, she gave me one dice I, I, and she's rolling the other dice and we are both going together. <laughs> and, and, she, and we are rooting for each other. Hey, roll a two. <laughs> so we can go to the next one. That's the way she wants to play the game. And I, that told me that you know, fundamentally, we really love to be cooperative. Okay, we love to cooperate on some common goal. And the common goal in this case is, hey, can you find a way to live that uh, the earth improves as a result of us living? <laughs> That's, I think it's a very important project that we need to be working on together right now. Okay, no matter what country we are in, it doesn't matter, you know, or okay. what our background is. The, the uh prevailing culture would say, but this child has got to learn how to be competitive. Otherwise they're going to be crushed once they enter the, the right. corporate world. And this is a, you know, that is such an industrial age idea. Right. And we have to treat it like it's obsolete. Like everything in the, we, we're, are we in the industrial age? No, we're in the information age. So the rules should have changed, but they haven't. So gotcha. what should they change to? And now there's, there's, there isn't this rush to get all the work done that there was in the industrial age. We now can get all the work done. We can even build robots to do all the work. And then what do we do then? Just get rid of the humans because they, they we're still <laughs> stuck in, in uh, a wage? That, well, that's Jeff, that's Jeff Bezos' idea, uh, but I'm not, I'm not interested in that. I said, okay, if you want to play competitive games, let's just say that Jeff Bezos has won the game. And send him off to Mars. You know that's his reward. He send him off to Mars. And the rest of us now figure out a different game. <laughs> so, I mean, he can go there. I don't care. <laughs> but well, but he's now number two. Elon Musk is the rockets. He's right, okay. Number one now. So send him up to. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Maybe send one up every year, right? Who knows. <laughs> <laughs> after we get the after we get the uh, food truck though after the electric <laughs> Jamin, I came up with a name for the uh, for your food truck the electric chuck wagon. <laughs> but chuck wagon, it sounds That's like so dog mix too, and it's you know it's usually a horse drawn carriage, but in this case it's the electric chuck wagon. It'll be the super uh, sophisticated Tesla electric <laughs> truck with or and trailer. Total counterpoint awesome. what, what you, you pitch a chuck wagon and then you see the uh, <laughs> cross between a DeLorean and an 18 wheeler. <laughs> wow. What do you think about no, it? I, I, I hold the copy right. No, no patents. No patents, right, Celeste? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, no, I mean, I, so look, I think from, yeah. from uh, Jamin's perspective, sorry, Jamin, from Jamin's perspective, Jamin is trying to create a, a, the idea of something that is futuristic. People want to, people want to say, I want, I want that food because it's so sexy, right? Chuck wagon make it seem like it's 
from 100 years ago <laughs> yeah we'll, we'll we'll figure it out but thank you for thinking about this ray and please keep thinking um we're definitely gonna gonna, gonna figure this out um i'd like to comment on um the the idea of you know a city in the cloud is fine but ultimately the work needs to be done on earth couldn't agree more I, i'm an engineer too and when i studied civil engineering as an undergraduate one of the first things they taught us is, why are we called civil engineers? Um, raise your hand if you know if you know the reason why. The first branch of engineering, in fact, engineering period, was de facto originally military engineering, mm -hmm. right? Which is all about destruction. So let's make things that work, so that we can destroy, right? And so you know, beyond that, when they said, okay, now it's time to build bridges and, and churches and whatnot. Well, let's have civil engineering, civilian versus military. So um, anyway, of course we wanna make things work here on the planet, but we're in such disagreement and even competition about how we're gonna make things work. And there's a lot of ego and whatnot. This has been noted time and again throughout the different transformational communities that we're all members of right and so the big idea that i'm that we're really promoting here is let's build before we can re-architect life on earth we need an architectural firm where we can be in harmony where we can have transparency and tell the truth and yes disagree if we need to disagree and then let's talk about it Right. and work through it rather than do what we always do, which is, okay, well, I'm going to go back to my tree house and do my thing and screw you and you go back to yours and do your thing. Um, how do we reach consensus? But let's do it in the calm of an architectural firm, right? Rather than argue with picks and shovels on the construction site, right? Where so much is already happening, right? Um, we're, we're trying to repair an airplane that's in mid-flight and it's very chaotic. Um, yeah. So, so the, the whole idea the of the clouds, clouds is to create, I'm getting some echo here. I think maybe it might be from you, Silas, or maybe it's from Marco. But anyway, from Marco. create it, this safe space. I think it is Marco. Create this safe space. Here, I'm gonna mute Marco. <laughs> All right. Um, create this safe space where we can, and it's gonna take us time. I mean, if, you know, we all thought, oh great, 2020 COVID, we're all on Zoom, great, let's just figure it out. And uh, let's take a week and figure it out. No, that wasn't enough, okay, 11 days. Oh, well, that wasn't enough, how about two weeks? No, it needs to be an ongoing thing. And um, so that's the big idea here. But the ultimate goal, of course, is to implement stuff on, on the planet and hopefully in an exponential domino kind of way, um, because big problems call for big solutions and exponential climate change calls for exponentially growing solutions. As Arvin pointed out a few months ago, I thought he hit the nail on the head. He was saying, listen, whatever solution we come up with, it's gotta grow exponentially. So anyway, the whole idea is architecting the exponential. And that's the whole idea of the city in the clouds. Anyway, with that, I'm going on. No, that's the um, absolutely right. You know, it has to be something that gets people to move exponentially towards this new way of doing things. And uh, so, but I think we need to agree on the foundations, the axioms. We all have to have agreement on the foundations and it has to be based on the truth and, you know, and verifiable truth that we can go and check you know, uh, this is this what it is? And on open source, it has to be based on open source. Okay, it cannot be competitive. You know, it's my idea. I make my money off of this nonsense, right? <laughs> no, that's not allowed. Right? It has to be open source. It has to be uh, based on those two foundational changes that need to happen. You see, if you look at Western civilization, and I started off with. I mean, every civilization has gone through this, this process of, of learning how to live in harmony with nature. Yeah? Every civilization has done this. You know, Mayans did it, you know, they created the Amazon, 
you know, I mean, Amazon was not naturally like that. They were actually planting things that were food for us. They're really doing food for us. And so that's the, uh, uh, and Indus Valley civilization, if you look at all the civilizations that went kaput, they moved in somewhere else and they did it right the next time around. Okay. So then, you know, the people who, see, if you think about it, humans were all together in Africa once. And then we migrated out. Okay, we migrated out about 50, 60,000 years ago to every part of the world. So we are the only species that just spread like crazy. And it spread like crazy. And then we had to adapt to where we were. So the people who went to Europe had the hardest time to adapt. I mean, they had to eat animals, you know, <laughs> because it's, it's cold. There's nothing growing in winter. So it takes them longer to figure out how to get in harmony with nature. So they were doing this by conquering others. They conquered others, fine. So what happened to these, uh, um, these the other civilizations that became sustainable is that they got colonized. You know, once they figured out how to live in harmony with nature, uh, someone came along with a big gun and said, okay, now you know nothing, right? So they start by telling you your culture is garbage <laughs> and you have to start over. So then they say, okay, you know nothing. Sun goes around the earth. And you say, oh, wait a minute, you know, <laughs> it's the other way around. <laughs> okay, so you already start over from scratch. And then we say, Galileo discovered that it went the other way around. Or the Copernicus discovered. Well, there are people who will tell you, listen, dude, we knew it 5,000 years ago. <laughs> you just went listening to us. <laughs> right? All these a lot of these things are being are really rediscoveries, okay? So the foundational axioms, right? So like well, civilization start in Western civilization, think about it. First, it had to overturn the fact that the sun does not go around the earth. The earth goes around the sun. It took a while. A bunch of people got thrown in jail for saying that, you know? And, and then finally, they, okay, you're right. Secondly, you know, uh, it was... Black and brown people were put on earth for white people to enslave. And he said, wait a minute, no, that's not true. It took, took 200, 300 years to figure this out, right? So by 19th century, we kind of figured it out that that's not true. So then women were put on earth for men to possess. And then we said, okay, that's not true either. Okay. So now finally we are coming down to animals who put on earth humans to exploit. And he's saying, no, that's not true. That's not true. They're here on their own. Okay? And finally, happiness can be found by meeting all our desires one by one. I said, no, that's not true. We figured this out 5,000 years ago. We wrote all kinds of epics about it. Okay, So <laughs> it's not true. Happiness is within you. You look for it within. You don't go around consuming things to get happy. So I'm saying that when we build a civilization that's sustainable, it has to be based on the truth. Truth is that the sun you know, the earth goes around the sun. Women were not put on earth for men to possess. And then animals were not put on earth for human exploit. And black and brown people were not put on earth for white people to enslave. I mean, so we are all in this together and we are all part of a large system that actually is amazing. That has created homeostasis for herself, right? created homeostasis for herself by, by enslaving us. She really literally enslaved us. I mean, we made, she made us think that we are the bosses, but all along she was the boss. <laughs> and, and I mean, she created homeostasis out of this pile of junk, you know, human beings, right? And uh, dug a bunch of carbon from under the ground and pumped it up into the air and so now made sure that the earth can never go back to another ice age again. Hey, I think that's awesome <laughs> what happened. And now she's saying, wake up, wake up and let's all thrive together. And so we need to base this new thing on foundations that are correct. Happiness is within you. You can, you can look, you can actually, this is why Mother Teresa was so happy compared to Jeff Bezos <laughs> because she knew it. She experienced it, not just knew it, but she experienced it. Buddha, I mean, Buddha was a scientist, in my opinion, okay? But he was doing science of the inner world. He was experimenting on himself and figuring out what works, what doesn't work. 
and he was you know testing against nature and verifying that that is correct so that was science that's science okay it's not just science in the material world science in the inner world go ahead ray nature also let us beat us beat each other up <laughs> right yeah like uh jamin said a lot of our, our technology starts off a military <laughs> dump as much money as you want into this into this project because the military cannot spend too much so yeah and we if we're, we're not for the military we would not have the tools to even know that climate change is real right like, exactly yet. we wouldn't have satellites we wouldn't have uh the um even the culture of 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 science to measure everything we're so crazy determined to measure everything that there is so that's that's our role. That's nature saying we needed uh, one of these uh, ape species to eventually um, build all this stuff so that we can, um, as you say, with the thermostat species, become um, uh, uh, fulfill our true role. Maybe this is our, right. our true role. And you don't need to believe it literally. You just have to believe that science does fill all the gaps, that water always fills up all the spaces that, uh, you know, there's a certain ways that uh, evolution happens that um, create some things that seem absolutely impossible, like how every insect matches every kind of orchid that like the plant and the, the insect are designed for each other. That's crazy. How could that happen by accident? It's not accident. Nature is actually that clever. Yeah. And we have to remember yeah. that nature is more clever than we are because every time we exactly. understand what nature is doing, it's us that's wrong, not nature. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah, it's about acknowledging the intelligence that's driving us all together, right? So that that is running the process. So that's what that's what to me that's what faith is. Faith is saying I'm part of something much much larger. So I'm just going to surrender and say, how can I help? How can I help? Right? I know my ha happiness is within me, so I don't have to go look for it outside. So. I mean, so, but that was a con that was done on us. This is why the story of the wishing tree, you know, in the story of the wishing tree, they say that uh, the watching child saw through what was going on under the wishing tree. He saw the brilliant cosmic swindle that was being performed under the tree. So it's a swindle, meaning somebody is being conned. <laughs> Those who are wishing are being conned. So the, only, the difference between Jeff Bezos and Mother Teresa is that Jeff Bezos hasn't figured that out yet. He's really stupid. When, you, when you're accumulating, 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 you haven't figured out that the happiness is not there, dude. It's somewhere else. <laughs> he probably sees it as responsibility. <laughs> no. I mean, he's accumulating more and more by ripping off people, right? So... <laughs> He's ripping off the poor woman in Orissa who's growing rice, you know, giving her only five cents so he can sell it for two, three dollars. We need a new game. We need a new game, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. And, so much and we need a new city to design the new game. <laughs> I'll live on that street. Yeah. No, we all want to do that, right? So I'm basically, you know, uh, we, we were in a model where we, we were told, go accumulate wealth and then you'll figure it out. Then, okay. Then you realize, oh my God, all the wealth I accumulated is really blood money. <laughs> we start giving it away. <laughs> We're saying, what can I do with this, right? <laughs> and, and then you tell everybody, that's the way it is. Your children, you tell them, yeah, you also have to first play the game, accumulate wealth, and then you can give it away. <laughs> so, no, hold on a second. We can change the game. <laughs> Because Roland's that model doesn't work anymore. <laughs> Roland's got his hand up. Yeah, go ahead, Roland. Okay. I haven't got a long time to stop here. But I got something. Jamin, you all know, you know that I'm an agent of change. And my dream is that this community will be the lead in creating solidarity 
between Ben Bowler, John Raymer, Elizabeth, and I'm sure there's a whole bunch of others. Jamin is not the person to do this. But I think, I don't know how to say climate healers, Salish Ro Rail? Uh huh. Silas. 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 He said, We are a part of a big system. We need to get the big system under solidarity, Pope Francis says. And we need to then get rid of the economic model we have in the world where the rich get richer, mm -hmm. like the United States, says the Pope. He's my client, by the way. And um, he's just been informed of all of this stuff. Uh, Peter Dionysus was there and, and said, hey, hey, Pope, you understand that we are going to be I can if I get it right. Uh, one time, one billion times different in 50 years. We've moved into exponential change. So I am nominating you, Sullish, to maybe take the freaking lead and get this big system together. Because you're all you're all competing with each other. Okay, you're doing great things, but you're competing. You know, I haven't seen Elizabeth here. She's got some fantastic things going. Hmm. You know, I was just with uh, John Raymer. My God, they got they got thousands of people involved. Mm -hmm. You know, and uh, so that's my that's my two cents. Amen, hallelujah. Say what you got to say. I'm probably going to go. I got uh, I got a lot of things to do. Uh, hey, Roland, um, I'll kind of, I mean, I, I was part of J, uh, John Raymer and Ben Bowler's event. Um, so well, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, just recently. Recent one, yes. Okay. Then, okay. I didn't, I didn't see you there. I wasn't there very long. You know, all I know is they've sucked in my daughter. <laughs> and she is giving them all kinds of free help when she should not be doing so. She needs to focus on summer solstice event coming up this next spring. And she needs to get an internal change agent. I think I know who it is. I can't find her name. She's an indigenous uh, uh, native uh, South American. Uh, he just got her PhD in OD. Here's my thing. You guys are, you guys don't know what the frick you're doing. You're not trained in change making. I am. I have 1500 organizations behind me and I've learned a few things. And, and uh, you know, we're, we're proceeding. That's why I got to get off done and get working on this other stuff. But J Jamin is a genius. He's a freaking genius. Okay? But, but, as he said, I just read, you know, he, he has been lambasted what he thinks are from competitors. He's been mistreated. And, and that there's no, there's, we don't have time for that. Matt Fox, who I studied with, one week after he was ordained as a Catholic priest in 1967 at Loyola University, said to world unity, you know, that we've got to deal with climate change. And, 
and uh, uh, so, and, and he hears what he says, and Guy Gunderson says it. Jamin's on top of this. We may only have eight to 10 months to do it, or it's all done. There's no going back. You're going to have to leave India. You're going to have to leave the island of uh, James. Is going to have to leave the island where he's at because global warming is going to come in and wipe him out. Okay, it's, 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 we're all, it's already happening in the Amazon. The fires, is ha the fires are happening in Australia. They're happening in the West Coast here in the United States. You know, the, the hurricane, we just had the largest snowfall in the history of the United States, 40 inches up in the northeast, no power. What were those people going to do with no power because there's 40 inches of snow and even if they can get on their, their um, uh, snowshoes, there's no place to go. They're going to fucking die. Okay? So what I'm telling you is, you guys don't hear me. This is serious. This needs, this needs immediate response. But we need to get effective. You people are not effective. I know what effective is. My daughter was a head of organizational effectiveness in the United States at Allstate, the largest personal insurance company in the United States. It's about being effective. We are dancing and talk, 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 talk. God bless Hare Krishna, wow says the Chinese, my Li Lu friend who makes a million dollars a year consulting over there. He and I are working together in the Asia OD network. He co-founder with me, uh, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Wahe Guru for the Sikhs. Um, I'm, I'm trained as a Sikh teacher of yoga, Kundalini teacher. I've studied with Yoga Bhajan in France. I'm trained with Iyengar in yoga. I'm the only living person certified. I'm one of five. No, I'm the only person who is trained and certified in yoga and organizational change, living in the world. I'm not even supposed to be alive, but I fooled them, okay? And so I'm going out and as that, that black guy just died, I forget his name, you know? I'm going out kicking, man. I'm going out kicking. And uh, that's my kick to all of you. God bless, Hare Krishna, Wahe Guru, wow. And Jesus Christ. Amen, hallelujah. Goodbye. <laughs> Oh, is that dump and run? <laughs> oh, I'll probably hide here and listen to your response. I'm done. What's your daughter's name? Ariel. Ariel Sullivan. Of course. Okay. Ariel means God's lioness. Ariel, you know, she's the lead consultant to world unity with Ben Baller. Mm. Okay. She has, she has more experience anybody around the age of 30 in the world doing transformation. I mean, she... She put together the Mobile Spirit Sprint merger. She put that together. That's huge. She she put um, she saved Nordstroms. 
North Stromfield's dead. She went in there. She Marston's headquarters is 10 minutes from her house. She went down there with a team. Nordstrom was up for sale. They're not up for sale right now. Because they gave she <laughs> turned them around. You know, JP JC Penny's is gone. Sears is gone. Macy's is, oh, maybe, maybe not. Okay? We are in the area of exponential change. And I, and, and I am a Teilhard de Chardon fan because I am, Robert Pharisee is the Catholic Church's expert on Teilhard de Chardon. And I was named after his brother, Rollin Pharisee here in St. Paul, okay? And so Teilhard de Chardon has got it, life can only transform itself. That's what's going on. And let me repeat, Jamin knows this. We've got 10, right now from what I can hear, this has changed since we had our open space. This has changed. It was more. But now it's down to 10 months. We only got, that's, that's how much time we have left. And then we're gone. The same, the same thing will be the dinosaurs. The last time it happened was when the dinosaurs went. There's not going to be one bit of life on earth for the human being. There's not going to be one plant. Okay. There's not going to be any pure water, but the earth will continue on and make it long-term. And the amoebas will be coming back. But now, now are we hearing that if we're gonna, you people are in the position to do something. You know, I mean, God, uh, you know, climate healer man, my India friend, you know, um, uh, you're powerful, you're special, and you have a, you, you, you have a responsibility. And, and, and so that's why I'm saying, I'm thinking, you know, I have to be careful because I don't want to get in my daughter's way. You know, she just she just met with Ben. I don't know what they came up with. Ben Ben wants to do this. He wants to do a whole system transformation. There's no freaking leadership. Oh, there's a whole bunch of open space goes into leaderless chaos long term. I know. I've been involved in open space for 30, 40 years. Okay. <laughs> Amen, Jamin. You're a, Jamin, you're a freaking genius. We got to tap your potential. You're a genius. You're, Jamin is probably the most creative genius of anybody in world unity. That's my re that's the respect I have for him because of his work at Microsoft. Okay? He was the strategic director there. My God. Okay. <laughs> Amen. I'll, I'll shut up and I will listen in the background. How do I get out of here? Shut cut me off. I mean you can plant um, um yeah, I'm here. Out of mute. I I met Ariel at the uh, one of the uh, convergences and uh, and we talked for a while and I'm interested. I'm fascinated that she's so in, accomplished in the in the corporate world, 
and understands this uh, this world and also the uh, the side network kind of community. And I'm wondering about this this connection between uh, the corporatocracy and, and uh, um, capitalism and how that. She must understand that's one of the obstacles that need to be replaced, that they need to be overcome, that's become obsolete. That's, uh, you know, it's the system that's always won, but it has to start losing at some point or else we're going to be stuck in, in uh, where dollars make decisions and not, uh, not creative human minds. It doesn't matter how genius we are, it's, it's going to come down to overcoming some of these, these elements so that people hear anything other than, than dollar signs. Uh, it's great. Uh, it sounds like that she would be a great leader in that that capacity. Well, I have to get going. Thank you all very very much. And see you later this evening. I'm going to have to go write something up. All right. Very good. And from ten to two, starting in one hour, we'll have ICIC. The intentional city in the clouds, uh, as we'll be doing Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays, 16 hours per week, we're going to be architecting ICIC. So welcome back, everyone, to that. I'm going to have to take a bit of a break myself for the next hour. I'll go ahead and